Hello there, and welcome to the Art for All podcast. Sketchbook School's Art for All podcast, I meant. You know that by now. God, I've been listening to this long enough that I don't need to tell you that. Or maybe I do, because you've just approached us. You've just, you've just figured this out. You've just arrived. Speaking of just arrived, here's John Muir Laws, who is the uh, other half of Art for All. Hey there, everybody. I'm uh, John Muir Laws, um, but uh, since we're friends, you can call me Jack. And um, I am a scientist, uh, naturalist, observer, and hardcore uh, sketchbook journal evangelist, um, and Danny's friend. I'm happy to be with you all today. And we're happy to have you here. Hardcore though you may be. <laughs> That's right. Hardcore, does that mean like you listen to like a lot of skateboard thrash music while you're doing it? No, it just means that as I draw flowers, I kind of bang my head, kind of. Bang your head. Yeah. 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 I get it. It's intense. The same way. I think that's what we have in common. That's I think right. we have all, you know, we have the, this, only, the, the only tattoos, the whole thing. Man. Oh, oh, yeah, you too. Yeah. And the, but the, the, one of the, the, the things I've, I've learned is that you don't put that cool spiky collar or a um, wrist bracelet on your right hand, because then it makes all these indentations in the paper. And then if you're trying to do some subtle graphite shading, those little grooves show up on the paper. You know the problem, right? Yeah, I was wondering what those were, but yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, awkward. Totally. That's a bummer. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, I forgot to mention that I'm Danny Gregory. Did I mention my name? Um, no, I think we skipped, uh, glazed right past your introduction. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> My name is Danny Gregory. I am the former bass player for uh, <clears throat> a band called The Pencil Sharpeners. And I did not you know, know that. that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. Um, yes. In fact, I just uh, I met, I made a new friend recently who was in a band called Who Farted. I was like, really? Like, I've never heard of that band, surprisingly. Wow. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. How to out of the gate <laughs> limit your audience. <laughs> yeah, I think they weren't. I think that's what they were going for. <laughs> let's yeah, let's so, guarantee yeah. that we will be niche. They were going for like nine year old boys. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yes. Anyway. <laughs> um, yes. So uh, I am also, what else am I? I'm the founder of Sketchbook School. I am a dilettante. I am a, I don't know. Um, you're you're also somebody who's really inspiring in thinking about how to kind of enable people to pick up a pencil and go. And uh, that's, I, I, I just am amazed at how many people you've inspired and touched. So that's, it's kind of. I've Through my recordings a, a, with the pencil sharpeners, you mean? That's right. That's right. Yeah, that band changes lives. <laughs> it does. Um, but yes, thank you. Maybe we should introduce each other next time. Okay. We, we, but we could also we make it up. <laughs> I think it's better. So anyway, so what we do generally, if you've never listened to this podcast, even if you have, you might wonder what exactly we're doing here. Generally, what we try to do is we come up with a topic which will sort of guide the conversation. We loosely adhere to it. If you, if you clicked on this because you saw it on YouTube and you saw the thumbnail that said... What is the thumbnail going to say? It's probably going to say art as business. Kind of a tedious, boring name, but yeah, but that's, it's going to be called something like that. You might've seen that and you said, great, I'm going to come here and I'm going to get some tips on how to be a really successful business person slash artist. You might come away from that, from this recording with that, but maybe not. We'll, we'll, we'll do our best we'll to make it worth your time, but at least we're going to have fun trying. Exactly. We'll try. So I wanted to begin by talking, like, what is your favorite application, spreadsheet application? Are you an Excel man? Or are you more of a Google Sheets guy? Uh, Apple numbers? Like, where, where do you generally lay out your five-year plan and uh, track your, you know, your, your expenses? I think it would be a dot journal. <laughs> dot journal. Okay. It's not just like an old, like grubby exercise book with crudely uh, ruled lines or anything. 
I don't know, those, those little dots allow you to, I've actually got in front of me, um, this is for, uh, it, I have mm -hmm. the, um, the, the official Bob Ross. <laughs> Whoa, journal. That's a, what it's, is that? Is that a Bob Ross journal? A Bob Ross dot journal. Yes. Yes, that's right. Why a Bob Ross dot journal of all things? Um, I, I don't know, but it's like two great flavors together again. You got your chocolate and my peanut butter. You've got, it's, it's the, the pages are scattered with little Bob Ross paintings and Bob Ross quotes. And you had, uh, Did you pay good money for that? No, this was a gift. This oh, was a okay. gift that keeps on giving. It makes me well, happy. Speaking of business people, I have to say within the art world, the art instruction world, certainly, Bob Ross is kind of like this Warren Buffett or the Steve Jobs of business art instructors, would you say? Um, I, I understand that I have not yet seen the Bob Ross documentary. Yeah, nor have uh, I. I'm not, but, interested. Uh, not interested. Well, actually, I understand that it is. it may be worth our time. Apparently, there's a dark side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, not interested. Not interested. But uh, no, no, I'll tell you but, why, if you want, because I read an article a little, that sort of explained some of this stuff. Um, and I, then I read another article, which was actually more interesting, which was about the operations of Bob Ross International. Mm -hmm. But it was more in lines of the person who wrote it was trying to buy a Bob Ross painting. And they were like, how do I buy, how, where do I go? They assumed like, yeah, it could just go and like be pretty easy to buy one. Well, it turns out you can't really buy them at all. So Bob would do three paintings per episode, three of the same paintings. One he did kind of in advance, one he did on the air, and one that he did as a kind of a step-by-step -step instructional explanation thing that they would put into a book. So there were three more or less identical versions of every single painting he did. And he did hundreds and hundreds of episodes. They're all at Bob Ross Intergalactic headquarters. They're all like there in boxes and you can't really go out and buy them. Like you could go out and buy ones by his, you know, acolytes, but yeah, they're, and they, yeah, they're just there. Sort of interesting, but Bob Ross. Yeah. So from what I understand about that, that, documentary it's really about the sort of crappy things that happen after he died and various infighting and stuff that i just thought would be more depressing than interesting but i know a lot of people have seen it and liked it yeah well i i have not seen it 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 does have um it it, it does have my curiosity uh, peaked um i'm a i'm a bob booster um most recently on bob ross's birthday um, I got a bunch of people in the Nature Journal cl Club to go sport Bob Ross wigs. Um, while I gave a, a workshop online on how to draw happy little trees in my own way, not with the, the Bob technique, but then to, to go outside with our Bob Ross wigs and uh, everybody in celebration of his birthday bring a, had brought a trash bag with them. And we went out to different natural areas and did a trash cleanup in honor of the Bob. Was, did Bob care about that kind of thing? Uh, well, he cared about them squirrels. He cared about his nature in a big way. Uh, yeah. I think that that was something that was important to him. Um, and uh, even if he had never, I don't think he ever particularly directly prompted people to do that, that I'm aware of. But I don't think he would think it was a bad idea. No, I'm sure he wouldn't. I mean, it's hard to say because this whole organization that's built up around him is seems to be like really venal and stifling and I don't know. That's just sort of vaguely what I've heard about it. But I think that Bob himself, I and mean, Bob was a hustler. You know, he started teaching based on um based based on a method really that he inherited from somebody else. He learned this method from uh uh what was his name? The German guy. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I, I I don't know. I I really don't uh so there's this German guy who also had a painting show and he um, would teach this technique of, it was called wet on wet, right? So it's wet on wet oil painting where you keep your whole thing moving and, you know, you, and um, what was his name? Uh, it's Bob, Al I want to say Alexander, something, I can't remember. I'm sure whoever's listening to this can correct me. 
Um, so he, um, Bob started teaching these classes. He was teaching workshops. And then he went to uh, his local uh, PBS station and asked them to film him a little commercial. That he would, because that's apparently was quite the way you did it. The, the days before YouTube and stuff like that, you would go to a place like that. They would film a little commercial for you. And then he was, would run it on local TV to uh, promote the fact that he was teaching a workshop in town, like he would go on tour. And then the people at the PBS station said, this is really interesting what you're doing. We like this. Would you be interested in doing a show? And so it was some small, like Florida affiliate or something like that. And that's, he ended up doing basically a season of the joy of painting. And then that kind of became really successful. It's interesting because there's a Julia Child show on HBO right now which is uh, sort of a fictionalized version of her life that is a very similar kind of story. She writes a book, ends up doing a thing with a PBS show, it takes off, becomes a big thing. But yeah, so Bob was doing this show and then it got picked up and by other PBS things and it became a big deal. And then his son, I think, started working for him. And then, you know, Bob uh, died young. And, but meanwhile, he had developed this whole system for teaching other people how to teach the same methodology and that lives on now so i mean he's been dead for 50 years or something still lives on Hmm. so yeah you know isn't that you know somebody kind of uh coming from the 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 outside kind of looking at at, at, at what he did, it'd be easy to think that like there was some kind of grand plan that you had all along and it led to this sort of in hindsight, all these things, so much stuff really seems planned. Um, yeah. But so much, I think, of kind of making our way and figuring out who we are or kind of the development of a business is just this sort of odd happenstance of this leads to this and that puts you in contact with this person. And if you do well and are kind there, they want to work with you again. And then this other thing happens. And because of that, this person told their cab driver's nephew about something else. And there you are. But in hindsight, it it seems like there's this grand plan. Yeah. And I think that that is, that is a problem really, because I think a lot of people are under the impression that that's how things work. And that um, the the grand plan is how they, they work. Yeah, the people, I think they reverse engineer people's success and they say, okay, I want to be the next Bob Ross. So therefore I need to work my way backwards to do the things that he did. But a lot of the things that he did were out of necessity or out of mistakes. I mean, he had an Afro. Why did he have an Afro? Do you know? Um, I don't know. Because it was cheap. He had no money. And he figured that he could, that he would have an Afro in order to not have his hair cut less often. Good move, Bob. Yeah. And then it became like a thing. And he was like, okay, now I have enough money to get my hair cut on a regular basis. <laughs> but people were like, no, oh, hold on, Bob. You got that Bob, afro. We, we like yeah. So he was kind of stuck with it. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. But I mean, he was lucky. It became a trademark because otherwise, I mean, look, if I was to become famous like Bob Ross, what would people wear? Exactly. They would have to wear like uh, bold well, masks, bold toupees. Well, you, you, you'd have the, the, the official Danny Gregory razor. Oh, that's true. Shave your head. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So, but, but I I agree with you. I think, I think what happens is it is, it is difficult to look at somebody who's successful creatively and understand exactly what they do and how you can be informed by it. So I think that's something that I'd like to go into a bit deeper because I think that let's talk a bit about why that is so much the case. And I think it begins with the fact that there isn't a place to get a job as an artist. Like you don't, you know, you you don't like have a resume that makes, you know, and fill it out and apply for a job and work your way up the ladder and become more and more successful as an artist. It It doesn't really work that way. Although in some ways it does. In some ways, being an artist is really more of being a business person, being an entrepreneur. And, um, or as they now call it, solopreneur, that you are 
kind of looking usually for lots of different ways to make a living. That it isn't as simple as I do a painting, um, I go to a gallery, they sell yeah. it, yeah. I get the money back, and then I can go and do things. I mean, I have so many people contact me and say, can you help me get an agent because I want to be a professional writer? And so it's mm -hmm. sort of like, okay, mm -hmm. so if I was to tell you that you could have an agent, here's the agent, go to that agent, then they will take your book and they will sell it to a publisher. And then you just sit back and rake in the bucks. It just doesn't work that way. None of it works that way, really. I mean, it may be in movies it does, but the fact is that everybody, whether they're a writer, a musician, uh, a painter, a sketchbook artist, invariably has lots of sources of income that you kind of quilt mm -hmm. together and this kind of way of, of making a living. It's like, there are all kinds of things. So like, what are some of the things that you do to, to support yourself and your family besides male modeling? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you don't mind saying, I don't, I don't mean to like get the IRS on you, but like, what are the, if you don't mind talking about it. No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't mind at all. But, um, but l l what, uh, I'm going to write down what do I do? What do I do? Um, but before I, I dig into that, I just wanted to bounce off a couple of things that you were saying because I think it really it really is important. And I also want to underscore what you were underscoring. This idea of the grand plan and then you're going to you know, hit engage and then <clears throat> it's going to all work for you. Nothing really went that way. And we sometimes, if somebody is successful in something, we try to reverse engineer what they did. And we get the impression that what they did was to make a whole bunch of really good decisions. When really a big part of that is that they're in the right place at the right time and they got really lucky. But we attribute it, it all to the deliberate decisions that that person made. You know, if you were able to kind of like rewind the clock and um, just kind of shake up the etch a sketch of the universe a little bit and let it play out again, there's no guarantee that um, the the Beatles or U2 or Elvis or um, you know uh, pencil sharpeners the pencil sharpeners would would be the stars, right? There's um, the, the world kind of, there's, there's, there's a, a kind of vacuum space that wants to sort of suck some kind of superstar into it. And sometimes those people are very skilled and sometimes they're not. And, but a lot of it is that they were in the right place at the right time and serendipity happened. And then they are a superstar, but you, you run the universe again. And, you know, the, the artists that kind of emerged as the greats, it would be in, in music, in, 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 in literature, in anything. A big part of that is just that, you know, the, the right manuscript ran, ended up on the right desk at the right time when somebody had was not before they went out for lunch. They got it after their, they went out for lunch. And so they weren't quite as grumpy. And then they looked at it with a kind of warmer eyes. Like if you are up for a parole hearing and you go into your parole hearing before lunch, you're much more likely to get denied than after lunch. There's just like all this weird randomness that kind of goes into the world. But then we later on attribute it to like the business genius of Steve Jobs. Right. And when a big part of what went on is jobs got lucky. And, but then we sort of attributed everything to, you know, things that, that he did. And the same is true in our careers. The same is true in our careers that like, as, as, as an artist, there's, there's no kind of master plan that I'm kind of moving towards if I kind of back up, I can see there are a number of things that kind of set me up. So I was kind of pre-adapted to take advantage of opportunities when they came by at the right time. 
but and in hindsight that looks like oh you're just you're moving towards this 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 goal but that's not really how it felt moving along and that's i think a mis and and like right now kind of looking forward i don't have a, a master plan but i know that in 10 years looking back there's going to be a sequence of events that is is surprising and interesting that is of opportunities taken things built books written you know artwork created and uh but but it's but it's not something that i'm plotting from this point back here i i hear you and i and i agree with you but as advice it's not terribly helpful because it's sort of like well i guess i'm not lucky No, no, tell me. You have to be in the right place at the right time. But to do that, you have to be in a lot of places at a lot of times. So you have to keep showing up despite the fact that you're not getting anywhere a lot. Because, you know, it's a one in a hundred shot. But if you go to a hundred places, you'll almost certainly get a shot. You know, and I think the Beatles, you know, the Beatles spent... um an awful lot of time, eight eight hours a day, playing in these sort of uh, clubs in the basements in in, in Germany. Um, they put in a lot of time and effort in working their way towards it. You know, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs failed mul in multiple ways, but he also, um, you know, he came back. He kept he kept trying, and so I think that that is. A key part of it is is sweat, you know, and I think that that unfortunately we look at people's success and we think either a they had a plan or b they were lucky, but the reality is, it if you do thousands of things, it can appear that you can carve a plan out of that. You can look back and go like, oh, these are the things that they did that were correct that led them to this place, but of course you're then discounting all the things that they did that weren't correct. You know, but those things were necessary in order to find this thing. And I think, I mean, I think this is generally true in business. I think it's more of a, a case in creative business. I think there are ways of being kind of successful in business, not guaranteed, but more successful in business. If, for instance, you go to a corporation and you work your way up the corporate ladder, you know, and you have good reviews from your boss every year and you incrementally you know, grow your salary and you sort of work your way up. You can, you can make some progress in a fairly linear way. When it comes to being an artist, which is really being an entrepreneur, um, you know, virtually every successful entrepreneur has failed over and over and over and over again. And the ones who endure are the ones who keep at it. But the mythology is doing so many people such a disservice because it appears to suggest that you should take a different kind of path than that. And the path it's, you know, it's going to be much clearer when it isn't. I thought I was going to get to disagree with you, but I think I'm going to end up agreeing with you <laughs> that, yeah. So that there's, there, there's not this one little straight arrow path. Um, and you're going to doggedly do that. You're going to put on a, bunch of different shoes and some will kind of fit and some will fit really well and some um it, it's 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 not gonna work but you 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 play in all these different places and you're continuing to work at it and you talked about kind of the sweat equity that you're you're putting in i think that that that's important maybe i can call this the 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 american idol fallacy Right, you're an artist, and you're going to, um, you're going to, you know, practice in your garage, and then you're going to discover, be discovered, and then you're going to go platinum. Um, that there's this sort of one little event that, you know, I'm going to get that. It's sort of like when people think I'm going to, I'm going to win the lottery. Um, I, I think your chances of kind of the American Idol discovery are about the same as, as, as winning the lottery. 
So it's a nice idea that kind of you can have in your head, but it's probably not going to happen that way. And so what you do want to do is to have a bunch of different irons in the fire and um, on, on the things that you are the most passionate about, the things that you are really, really into, that energy allows you to stick with those longer than um than than sort of less sort of projects of passion sometimes these projects of passion end up being the ones that kind of pan out for us but sometimes th it's not going to work that that way but but that but you're still getting that practice in um mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. I think I think another thing to think about is also, and you haven't gone down your list of things that you do yet, but I'll preempt that a bit by saying, you know, a lot of times we do things that are less glamorous, but help to help us to meet our ends in some other way. So, you know, I mean, for me, I spent years in advertising, you know, and I made a living doing that. And I have things that I do now that, you know, if I, you know, if I need money, I don't necessarily, I'm not really willing to compromise the art that I make in order to make more money, but I, cause I can make money doing something else, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a, like, oh, I'm now that thing, you know, I'm now, um, I'm only, you know, I'm identifying based on the ways that I make money. That's not, that's not necessary. Um, but I think, Every artist who I've known, they just have a range of different things they do, and some of which they talk about, and some of which they're known for, um, and others are their bread and butter. And you know, they they may be really good at them. They may be, you know, pretty passionate about doing a good job at them. But the things that they're known for are just some of those things. But again, this is the the same problem with what we were discussing before, which is you. That's what, that's what people coming to it old think that you do, that you just, you know, write a book and you make a lot of money and therefore you don't need to do anything else but write books. And therefore that's all I want to do is just sit around writing books. Well, the fact is that the vast, 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 vast majority of writers make virtually nothing out of their books. They write books for lots of other reasons. And one of the reasons is they may just enjoy writing a book. Um, they may have an idea that they really think is important to share. They may be writing a book in order to promote some other thing that they do, that the book kind of is sexier. Um, they may, uh, you know, they may have just tried it as an experiment. Um, this, they may just, you know, like that, the pleasure of having your name on a book on the shelf. It may give them, you know, uh, credibility. There's all kinds of things that go into it, but it's really easy to misunderstand that. And to think, oh, well, I could never be that successful as a book writer. But the fact is that the books that are nominated for the National Book Award each year tend to sell like four or five thousand copies. That's it, you know. And four or five thousand copies, even if you do the math, right? Say a book costs twenty bucks, five thousand copies, and that's what a hundred thousand dollars. That's the gross cost. And the author's getting like maybe 8% of that. So you're making maybe, maybe eight grand. Um, and it may have taken you five years to write that book or longer. So it's, it's a not, a, you know, you could, it's not a way to make a living. That's not why people do it. Um, occasionally there are people who make it much bigger, but there's such a minority that they're really, they're kind of irrelevant. Um, but there is this what's called the long tail, which is the that the hit makers are. The long tail means that I mean it applies, for instance, in the music business. If you think about how many records have been recorded, right? Um, and there's a hundred that make a lot of money, right? So if you draw a graph, the graph is that there's a small number that make a large amount of money. But then there's an enormous number that could be 
100,000, half a million records that are out there. And those records might include like, you know, um, Serbian traditional dance music, or they might be, you know, spoken word poetry, or they might be, you know, a band that might be the Pencil Sharpener's Greatest Hits album. Whatever it is, there's many, many, many records out there that make small amounts of money, but, you know, that's the whole industry. So it doesn't mean that you can't be at some other part of the tail. You don't have to be at the top. That's just the part that people are aware of. So anyway, but going back to um, our own examples, I mean, I think it's interesting to think about, A, what are the sources of income that you make? So in other words, thinking of yourself as a business that makes profit, but also what are the things that you have to do to manage your business? Um, besides just going out in the field and doing nature journaling. You know, it's a, it's a more involved enterprise, obviously. Yeah. Well, I mean, it could be, we could be creating tension that keeps people listening to the podcast. Oh, there's, there's, there's so many, many threads that I want to, to pick up on, but I, but I kind of bounced away from that. What do I do question? So I, I think I probably should go back to that because you asked directly. So, so I'll, I'll tell you kind of what's, what's in, in, in my bag and kind of how that came about. Um, at one point, I, th the reason that I got in really involved doing scientific illustration, um, which is sort of how I, well, I, I started um, by just having my own sketchbook and I loved running around in the woods and drawing pictures. And then I had this dream in my head of what I really want to do is to, to make a comprehensive field guide of the Sierra Nevada mountains with, that was all illustrated in color. And it was just this, you know, there's no way that anybody could hire an illustrator to do that. It would have to be that there's some illustrator who just wants to spend years running around in the mountains drawing flowers and bugs and birds and star charts and the animal scat and the mammals and the frogs and the, you know, I, I wanted to have that field guide to make my backpack lighter because I was carrying all these different books. And so I decided, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. This was sort of my, my grandmother's last gift to me was sort of time to, as she was dying, to kind of contemplate my world and what I wanted to do. And I thought to myself, I really want to make this book. And I, whether or not it would be a successful thing or not, I wasn't sure of, but I knew that this was the book that I really wanted. And I knew that at the end of my life, I'd be really sad <laughs> if I never made that book. So it was time to do that. So I went down to Santa Cruz and um, I, they had a scientific illustration program there. I dropped into that and I had this dream. I th what I thought I, before I'd been working at the California Academy of Sciences, which is a science museum in San Francisco, and they have this large kind of research contingent that they do. I thought that they would look at this project and say, that's brilliant. We love it. We're going to support you. We're going to give you a salary. And at the end of it, we're going to have this book. And it'll be the California Academy of Sciences field guide. They weren't interested in doing that. Um, but I still wanted to make my book. So but when the program ended, I just grabbed my backpack and a bunch of paper and I went up to the mountains and I started drawing bugs and started buying bugs. And then I started running out of uh, money and I drew a bunch of flowers. And I, and at, at one point I was kind of even going into, I would, I, I remember at one point I made tomato soup by going and getting some ketchup packets from a uh, from a McDonald's um, in the Sierra, and I went and I got I got some ketchup packets and and put those in with some water. And I was thinking like like this really this is not quite coming out the way that I had planned, but but boy, didn't I have fun today drawing all those 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 those, those wildflowers? My one thing that was nice about this was that I, I kind of, I started with the, the, view, the office with a view and, uh, but it, it didn't pay well, but I got along well with my boss. Um, 
And then I got lucky. I got lucky. Um, what it, had happened is that while I was, when I was in college, I, uh, there was a publisher that I really, really liked who, um, I wanted to illustrate. I thought I could illustrate for this person. I took my, 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 uh, my, my work to Malcolm Margolin, the publisher of Heyday Books. And he looked at my stuff and now looking back on it, the, I've seen the portfolio that I brought to him and I know why he didn't go like, oh, this is great. Let's work together. Because it wasn't very good. It was really, it was, it was amateurish illustration um, at its best. Um, but I was sincere and he encouraged me to kind of, you know, keep doing and keep working and keep practicing and um, let's be in touch in the future perhaps. And um, then he started a magazine called Bay Nature Magazine. And one of the people kind of getting that project off the ground with him said, well, I know this guy, Jack, and he loves nature sketching. What if we had a page that was sort of just a sort of a page out of a nature journal, each issue, there would be this one page out of a nature journal. Well, they liked that idea. And so I started doing that. And so I ended up kind of through the back door working with this guy. And that same uh, woman who had kind of originally kind of hooked me up there, um, I told her about my my sort of the problems I was having. And she said, why don't you go talk to, why don't you go talk to Malcolm again? And so I did. And I, I, I went into his, his, his office. He has, and he's, and he was this wonderful, wonderful man. Um, so uh, less hair on top than you have, but with a giant white Karl Marx beard and just intense eyes. And he, he knew what he loved and he knew what was pa he was p what passionate about. And I, on a little round table this, um, in front of his office, I laid all my little drawings that I've done out so far and I, and I showed him what I wanted to do. And he loved the idea. He loved the idea. But, and I was thinking that, you know, then they give me an advance and then that, that finances me with this advance because I had heard there are these things called advances. Well, it turns out advances are a few thousand dollars and that's not going to get you very far because this was like a six or seven year project. And so he said, well, here's what I can do. I believe that you're really going to do this. I think that one way or another, you're going to find a way to do this. He could sort of tell that I was all in and he loved the project. And he said, what if... <clears throat> I give you an advance, but instead of giving you the money, I give it to my grant writer and have her go to town to try to fundraise for you and this project. And he also offered to go with me into his best funders and to make a pitch for the project and for money. And so he went with me to the, the, the Goldman Foundation and all these other places and and made a pitch for me and in and was successful was really really successful and that i went from you know trying to figure out which bill to pay and and um whether the 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 the, the ketchup was better at mcdonald's or jack in the box um to figuring out which scanner I wanted to buy. And it was, it was amazing. But he took that risk on with me because I was clearly showing up for the work. There had also been a history and sort of an established relationship. So it's meeting people, being good to people, helping other people out and then they want to work with you again. If I had kind of stormed out of his office when I was an undergraduate, <laughs> you didn't like my illustrations, uh, I never would have, none of that would have happened. Um, so as a result of that. Also, he came up with ideas that you would never have had on your own. No. He, he was 
he was creative in his business. In other words, he saw the, the goal, but he realized, okay, there's a lot of different ways of getting there. And, um, you know, and he was applying really different kinds of perspectives in order to get to this interesting place that made it possible for you to do this thing. Right. That's right. That's right. So it's a team. Yes. Yeah. And, and he had never done that before. He had never done that before. And he took a risk because if I bailed on the project partway through, he then would have all these funders saying, where's my project? And he'd say, well, my author bailed. And so that was, he was sticking his neck out for me. He took a risk and it was, it was a lesson for me in like the importance of just as we're doing whatever we're doing, the importance of relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is really, really important. And it's also relationships in which you are giving, not just taking. That's another really important. Thing. So, cause I'll see, I'll have people who contact me and they'll say, can you help me get this, that, or the other? And I'll think, I don't know you. I mean, I like to help people, but I don't know you and I don't even know how serious you are about what you're doing. So I could help you, but then I might be wasting my kind of capital, not my literal capital, but my connections. If I went to somebody else and said, hey, can you help this guy? And then it turns out the person was just a flake. Um, it, it, it really affects me and, and it affects anybody who I could help in the future because I've kind of blown that opportunity, right? That connection. So, so, but also when people come to you and they don't give, but they just ask and take, um, you know, it's, that's another way to not succeed. So it's also like, what can you, you know, what, what is the other person going to get out of helping you? That's, that's an important thing to think about. It's not, I mean, they may be making money out of you. They may be feeling good. They may share your agenda. They may just like you. It may have had um, a positive, you might remind them of themselves when they were young, whatever it is. it is. It is a thing to bear in mind that just because somebody can help you doesn't necessarily mean they have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that, I think what's also interesting is if this was a movie, you know, and, and then the final scene would be, and here's Jack signing a copy of his book in a bookstore, right? But the fact is, Life isn't a movie. It's a it's a series of movies. It's it's the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit trilogy, and it's constantly being remade. So, so you get to the end and you have that book come out. But even though it's been this really big goal of yours, it doesn't necessarily mean that your quest is over. That's right. That's right. And it's and it's still a hustle. And there's still I still have a whole bunch of irons in the fire. So now, what does it look like? Um, I'm not currently writing a book. But I've written now after that first one, maybe it's five or so different books. And um, they are on topics that people are interested in. And um, they're, 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 they're doing well. So that's kind of, that's going on in the background. And then the nice thing about that is even though you're right, you don't make a lot of money from making a book, but it is also then passive income it's there in the background generating money for you. Yeah, I remember having like one really important meeting that I had once with, there was a guy who um, asked me to illustrate a book that he'd written. And so he was kind of giving me some advice and he came out with a book like at least once a year, sometimes more. He had published like 40 or 50 books. They were all kind of around the same topic. And I said to him like, what's the point? Like, why do you write so many books? And he said, because you make a little bit out of each one. And if you have lots and lots and lots of them out there, then you can make a living off that, you know? And that's why, you know, that's why people self-publish on Amazon because you can come up, there's a whole like interesting business model of people who write their own books to sell on Amazon on interesting topics that they kind of, basically the cover and the title is what sells the book. 
which is true in real publishing as well. Um, and then they will write lots of variations on that book. And as you say, passive income, it's like you, you continue to make a little bit of money off lots and lots of those. But you do need to continue to do stuff. I mean, you do need to be out there. You do need to self-promote. Yeah, I mean, I still talk about books I wrote 20 years ago. And I don't do it because, oh, I might make a few bucks out of it. I do it because they're, it's all part of the body of work that you've done. So for me, my hustle is um, those books are there. Um, and when, I'm finished a, when I finish a project that I'm currently working on, um, I've now got the idea for another book. So I'm excited about starting, starting another one. But the, I am, I thought that as an illustrator, most of my work would come in from something like, like, I really need an illustration of a duck. Can you illustrate this duck for me? And then you like, don't worry, I'm your man. And, and then you know, I can draw the duck and then the big check comes and, you know, you do an illustration for this person or that person in this project. But that is a very small part of, of what I do. What I what I'm really excited about these days is getting, is enabling other people to, um, to be able to create art themselves. You, 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 you get this to, to, I want to be, I want to open up the door to observation in nature through art and help people connect with the natural world that way. So I'm now teaching lots and lots and lots of classes. Um, each week, at least three different classes. Um, last week was, I think, five classes, six classes, taught six online classes. Um, and they, they take a lot of work and focus and energy, and I'm offering them all. My, my business model has been that I want everybody to do this, I also want to make a living, so I've been offering everything for free, and let people pointed people towards a portal to make donations if they're able to, but if they're not, um, I still want them to use all these resources. So, um, and what has been amazing is that it has been um, just wildly successful. Um, the People, people are enjoying the classes, enjoying the workshops, sharing the material, and most people take it for free. And there are enough people out there who are able to and have the mindset to support me, and they are. And that has been the major... The donations that come in through that have been the, sort of the major um, sort of financial economic support for all the work that I do. That's really great because because I think what you're doing is is also part of an important cause that you believe in in terms of um, in terms of nature and supporting the environment. And um, so, in some ways, it's to say political it is political in a sense that you're you have a cause you have uh, a mindset that you're trying to to encourage and so part of your compensation for your efforts is the kind of encouragement and support of your ideas you know that, that so doing stuff for free that a lot of people believe in um is part of your compensation which which is true for me as well i mean we're doing this podcast now. We're going to make, I'm telling you, one of these days, we're going to make those sweet podcast dollars. It's going to, they're going to be flowing in. It's going to be unbelievable. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we're here to encourage art for all. I was also thinking about, do you remember the movie Fargo? And do you remember, do you remember that movie? Yeah. So do you remember what, that her husband was um, a, a, a stamp painter? And his whole, like, he's like a minor character in the background, but he was, it was all about, like, would he get to do, the, like, the 20, the, whatever the first class stamp was. And he was trying to do, like, a certain kind of duck. And it was all about this whole, like, there's a whole kind of world I'd never even thought of before. Like, the, yeah, 
Yeah, it's like the whole world. And she was like, oh my, she was like, it was almost like that was, he was the most important person, the most successful person because he, like, if you got your design picked by the post office, but what, like, what was the denomination? Like, you don't want to have like the, you know, you don't want to have a denomination that people don't really use. So that was, and then... Yeah, I don't think the movie made before that, but I think he got like a three cent stamp. And, it, and I think his wife was like, you know, but if you think about it, the next time they raise the stamp, everybody's going to need the three cent stamp. So, because they're going to need it until they buy the new stamp. I, I, will, I will look for that. That's, that's wonderful. Um, so, I'm about to say something that might kind of contradict what I said earlier, but I think that this might be more useful for people kind of getting started. Um, yes. Um, have your dream and stick to things, but what's going to pay the bills is those three cent stamps. Um, and if you do that and you do well at it and you're kind to people that are around you, um, the next opportunity, and you don't know what that is, is going to be building out there and you can, you can go out and you can look for these things, but sometimes they just sort of fall into your lap in these sort of weird ways. And so what you want to do is to be ready to take advantage of it when these things come up and think of like, oh, this could be a really interesting partnership. And so it could be an interesting partnership, A, because you might make a lot of money. It could be an interesting partnership because um, although it's not really well funded, it is something that will get you in front of a larger audience. And that's gonna make all sorts of opportunities for you. Or it is a partnership that you really believe in, something that you personally are passionate about. And so I do a, a bunch of illustrations for, 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 for projects that, that are pro bono um, because I love what that organization is doing. And they, um, they don't have funding to do that themselves, but um, now they've got a t-shirt and it's got the critter on it and they're totally stoked about it. And it is my way of helping support them in the project they're doing. So it might be something that's, that for you is your personal mission related. It could make you a lot of money. It could be just a really important contact and you don't know kind of where those pieces are going to kind of come together in the future. But if you're doing the best you can with where you are and you're being kind to people, I think that that really does. And then you're, you're looking for what are the next connections? What are the next connections? I find that's a useful approach. Yeah. I, I, I fall sort of a similar path, but um, it's a sort of a mixed thing. As you say, it's like on the one hand, you should take on as many opportunities as you can, because you never know what's going to happen with them. But over time, you start to become a little pickier about them. And it isn't just about money. It's really about what is the quality of the experience. Yes, yes. So at the start of your career, when you know, you're know you there and you're looking at the ketchup packets, kind of going like, mm, this is going to be really good. Um, we kind of have to take whatever kind of comes our way. But as we get more established, you get through your practice, through your continued training, you're developing capital, right? And you can then trade that in at some point for perhaps for more money. And so then what you can start doing is saying like, um, yes, I will do that, but for, for, for this much. And then some, uh, some potential project managers will go like, ooh, that's out of our budget. And you go, that's okay. Um, but you know, uh, maybe I can put you in contact with this other person who also might do a really good job. And because at some point there's going, there, there may be more projects than you have time for. Um, the, you can also trade up for things that are more meaningful to you so that um, you're still taking the same n number of, of, of projects, but you are, um, but the purpose behind it is, is more once you kind of get to a sort of a certain certain threshold where you're kind of economically you're fine a little bit more money here or there doesn't actually make a difference or a change in your in your level of happiness when you're below that level you need every dime 
right? But once you kind of get to a certain point, the three things that are are going to make the most difference, I think, in that there's sort of this kind of uh, model of intrinsic motivation. Um, and what's often pointed to in, in that is that the idea of mastery, autonomy, and purpose. So mastery, by doing this, I'm going to be developing my own skills and becoming a master at, at duck illustration. Um, or autonomy. I'm getting to do the things that are I'm I'm more interested in, and I don't have somebody kind of breathing over my shoulder and the deadline and 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 these sorts of things. That's going to make your quality of life better. And also purpose. You're doing things that are where you go like, wow, this little organization that is monitoring snowy plovers is doing such great work. And I get to do a little project in cooperation with them. That was really fun. I feel really good about it. My life is better. So you can trade up. At the start, you're kind of, when you're, you know, behind the curve financially, we sometimes have to kind of, we'll, we'll take whatever we can get. But then when you get these opportunities, don't always trade up for more money. Once you kind of reach that threshold where you're, I'm I'm good. Then then thinking about that autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I think those are kind of those are elements in a in a happier life. That's an, it's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, I think I can also tell you there's so many times that I'll run into somebody and they'll say, "I heard you speak like 11 years ago at such and such." I'm like, "What was that thing again? Did I even speak there?" I think, oh, okay. So I like dropped a little seed 11 years ago, you know, in a place that I wasn't even sure anything would ever grow. But I just did it. And then years later, it turns into a thing. You know, a lot, there are a lot of things that are long gardens that take ages to germinate. It's not all the fast hits. It's not all the big, you know. I mean, I've done talks where I've talked to like, had an audience of thousands of people. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a rush to do those kinds of things. But I've also had talks where I've talked to like 25 people and really engaged with them and really felt like I was doing something meaningful. I've also had talks with 25 people where like half of them were eating lunch and, and on their phones. And that's like, that makes you feel like, God, why did I even get out of bed this morning? It's hellish. Um, so there's all different kinds of ways. It's like, there are all kinds of audiences that you can speak to. There's all kinds of people who will appreciate your work in totally different ways. Um, and you just got to expose yourself to a lot of stuff. I mean, this is why I think time and again, the, the, our, our theme is always going to be try it, say yes, put yourself out there, do the work, keep at it. Don't be overwhelmed by your expectations. Don't say like, oh, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, because you never know where things are, you know? But the thing that will continue to motivate you is that you like doing this stuff, you know? Don't let your ego get in the way of that. Go back to, I like making these things. And if I can do them, if I can make half my living from doing them, and I have to spend the other half of my time earning money doing something else, then fine, you know? And the funny thing is, like, if you have to just go out and earn money, you can do it in a much more concentrated way. If you say, you know, I just need to earn a chunk of money, you can put your head down, you can earn that chunk of money, and then you can have the time to do the other thing that you want to do. But if you're constantly trying to twist the thing you have a passion for into making you money, you know, it's like that old thing about don't marry your mistress, you know, it's like, don't take this thing that you love and f try and force it into being something other than what it was that made you love it. Um, and so if you go out and you write a book just to make money out of it, the fact that you wrote a book isn't going to be pleasurable, you know. Um, but there are ways of having this kind of balanced diet that's made up of lots of different things. And there's so many kinds of opportunity now, particularly with the internet. There's just a million different things that you can do. And they all have different people who you're appealing to with them. So you could open an Etsy store, you could have a YouTube channel, you could teach an online course, you could, 
you know, do a newsletter, you could do a podcast. You, there's so many things that you can do and you can do, and I would suggest doing many of them, you know, Not, and, uh, and, and also that way you find out what are the things you like to do. You know, I like to do a lot of different things and I get different kind of pleasure out of different ones, but that's what it all adds up to. It's very different from getting a job, working at a company, having a boss, getting a paycheck, getting benefits, working nine to five and coming home. There, most of the decisions are made for you. And, you know, as a result, you have a lot less say in things. But this sort of lifestyle, which is made up of many, many different ingredients, and you can drop certain ingredients and replace them with others, there's all kinds of things that you can do to have a really interesting self-supporting life as an artist without it being like, I need a book published or I need a gallery or, oh, you know, I need whatever X, Y, or Z. You need all of it. And you're going to need it at different times in different ways. And it's all going to, it's just, it's really interesting. It's an interesting way. I kind of, my only regret, I didn't start earlier. You know, I mean, I, I started really publishing books when I was 40. I really, I left my career in advertising when I was 50. And I don't think I was ready to do it a lot earlier, but I wish I'd done it at least like five or 10 years earlier. I mean, you've been on kind of the same path since you were a little kid. Um, I've definitely found my way to it. You had that, you, you were seven and you had a 40 year plan. <laughs> yes, get out those spreadsheets. All right, cool. Well, good. Well, let's wrap this up. I think it was sort of an, I think it was an interesting conversation. I think there's a lot of, it's a rich subject. There's a lot of, a lot of things to, to open up about it, but we would love to hear from you as to whether you like this conversation, whether you had additional questions for us, you can write to us at podcast at sketchbookschool.com. A lot of people have been writing to us, telling us their stories. We try to write back when we can. We always try to acknowledge your email. Um, and we definitely read all of them. And uh, occasionally we will bring a question onto the podcast when we need a new kind of uh, burst of inspiration for ourselves. And we'll talk about whatever you asked. So feel free to write to us and, uh, we'll s and we look forward to hearing from you. All right, Jack, any final, th final thoughts about before close of business, as it were? I've just sort of been taking doodles on the sorts of things which we've we've been talking about. I think the one that resonates for me the most that I'd probably just stick a pin in is just to be kind. Be kind not just to the people at the top who you're trying to impress. Be kind to the people at whatever level you're at and the people who are below you and the people who are helping support you. And um the and think of yourself in service to them, how can you be of 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 use to 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 others? And those the relationships that we have, I think, are at the end of the day. From what I've seen so far, it, for me in my experience, the relationships that I have have been the the most important part of pushing this process forward. And you never know where that's going to come from. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I think it's a business strategy that is overlooked because ultimately business success comes down to, in whatever field, comes down to connections and networking. And uh, people don't forget, if you're mean to somebody, they will remember that for a long time. And if you're nice to them, they'll probably remember that too. So definitely it's nice to build a network of positive connections and also just bringing more positivity in the world makes you feel better. So don't feel desperate. Don't feel anxious. You know, be generous. Give as much as you possibly can to the people who may or may not become your customers. Um, that has definitely served both of us well which is you create opportunities by being generous with your time and your efforts. So with that, it's time to wind this thing up. And, uh, you know, 
get on with it. I've got to go make a new friend. <laughs> Fine. I'm going to go count the birds in my backyard. Birds are insane right now. Insane. I have to tell you this. So Tell me, tell me. Got a bird anecdote? I'm all in. Okay, so birds, we have a mulberry tree. It's been dropping like crazy for the last couple of weeks. It does every spring. Birds go berserk. And they come and they crap all over everything, which is another story. But this, but also there's the all the birds are they're all horny and they're mating everywhere. And then there's they're building nests in my backyard. This it's just insane. And then two nights ago, my wife took the dog out into the backyard. Two coyotes standing in our backyard. Yeah. So the coyotes come, they come after the bunnies. It's all, it's nature is lit in my backyard right now. It is happening. Spring. Wow. Wow. Hot nature. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. Spring in Arizona is, is, is you got some crazy that goes on and you, you've got, you also have some ridiculous birds that show up to, and to, to, to play for you. The, um, the, the, the paraloxia, I mean, it looks as good as it sounds. They're crazy, crazy things. That's really fun. A lot of birds migrating through, which is also weird because I never even thought of hummingbirds like flying in flocks, but but there's a lot of that going on. Uh, we had a hawk taking a bath when we had irrigation three days ago in the front yard. A hawk and all the other birds were like, oh my God, it's a hawk. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. It's really cool. But with that, we will leave you until next time. Thanks for joining us. This has been Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. Mm-hmm.